on World News Tonight. The Djokovic saga. Following the controversial detention of star tennis player Novak Djokovic, Australia is digging even deeper as the country mounts a crackdown on other foreign national players. This comes as even more supporters rally to voice unfairness against the strict jab rules in the country. Tonight, the details on the tensions. Fatal flooding. Brazil sees no end to chaos within the country as Mother Nature blows a heavy toll on the nation amid even more carnage due to the pandemic. Tonight, an update on the dire conditions of the displaced. Omicron alert. The WHO warns the world in being wary of the infamous variants, stressing that Omicron is not to be considered mild in any form. More attention being shifted to the strain as hospitals around the globe suffer at breaking point due to the surge in infections. A splash of color. Colorful floats, music and dance embellish the streets of Pesto in southern Colombia for the annual Black and White Carnival. This is Adaderna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Tonight's broadcast begins with the grim remembrance of the infamous Capitol riots in the U.S. A year on since the January 6th Capitol attack that stung the world, members of the U.S. Congress observed a moment of silence in honor of those America lost. A day of remembrance meant to preserve the truth of what moment in history. President Biden spoke from the Capitol in a powerful defense of democracy before directing his wrath towards former U.S. President Donald Trump, who he accused of storming talking the big lies that ignited the assaults. The former president of the United States of America has created and spread a web of lies about the 2020 election. U.S. President Joe Biden on Thursday used the one-year anniversary of a deadly attack on Congress to offer a direct and unequivocal condemnation of the lies spread by his predecessor that fueled the insurrection of January 6, 2021. For the first time in our history, a president had not just lost an election, he tried to prevent the peaceful transfer of power. In remarks from inside the Capitol, Biden painted a picture of a former president whose rhetoric left a legacy that posed a continuing threat to American democracy. Are we going to be a nation that accepts political violence as a norm? Are we going to be a nation that lives not by the light of the truth, but in the shadow of of lies. Take that house! Take it now! On January 6th, 2021, thousands of Donald Trump supporters laid siege to Congress, attacking police and rampaging through the halls in an effort to prevent lawmakers from certifying the results of the 2020 presidential election. Four people died in the hours-long chaos a year ago, which occurred after Trump urged supporters to march on the Capitol and, quote, fight, fight like, like hell. hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Biden, a Democrat who spent the first year of his presidency largely avoiding discussing his Republican predecessor, on Thursday leveled a full-bore condemnation of Trump for the violence of the riot in starkly personal terms. He sees his own interest as more important than his country's interest, than America's interest. And because his bruised ego matters more to him than our democracy or our Constitution, Trump, in a statement issued after the speech, said that Biden, quote, used my name today to try to further divide America. Some 55 percent of Republican voters believe Trump's false claim of election fraud. Many independent observers have warned that the damage done by Trump's efforts to undermine faith in the election he lost to Biden lingers on. I did not seek this fight. Biden on Thursday pledged to defend democracy. I will stand in this breach. In a bid for national unity, Biden described America not divided between Democrats and Republicans vying for control, but between the millions of voters who turned out in record numbers to cast ballots in a free and fair election and those who on January 6 sought to overturn the results. Now in an update to Novak Djokovic's jab jeopardy, it seems the government to, of Australia has more on the list of possible detentions as the country investigates visas of other tennis players as well, without cries from fans getting even louder that the nation assures that the champion is not being held forcefully. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Timothy Philip, who joins us now from Melbourne in Australia. For more, Timothy. Yes, sir. Australia has said it is investigating the visas of other foreign tennis players after detaining Novak Djokovic in a chaotic row over vaccine rules. 
The men's world number one remains in immigration detention in Melbourne and is facing deportation after his entry to the country was denied. He has launched an urgent court challenge to be heard a week before the Australian Open begins. Now more uncertainty surrounds the tournament schedule. Home Affairs Minister Karen Andrews said there was an intelligence to indicate there are some individuals that have not met the entry requirements and investigations must be carried out in regards to that. However, she did not say how many other players were under investigation or who they were. Ms. Andrews added that the tennis star was not being held captive and he is free to leave at any time that he chooses to do so. And Border Force will facilitate such a move. The federal government has criticised Tennis Australia for ignoring advice about the requirements for entry. Back to you, Shinobi. All right, thank you. That was Atta Terena World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. Over now to Kazakhstan's chaotic protests. The country's president claimed that constitutional order had mostly been restored in the Central Asian country. Hours after the first Russian-led troops arrived to help quell days of deadly unrest parked by a full price hike. Several administrative buildings in ruins, burnt cars and even blood-stained streets in Kazakhstan's largest city offer a peek into some of the country's worst political upheaval since the collapse of the Soviet Union 30 years ago. Almaty was the site of major clashes on Wednesday and Thursday, with protesters storming government buildings, a presidential residence, and seizing the airport, forcing the cancellation of all flights. Early Friday, President Kasim Jomark Tokayev said constitutional order had been restored, confirming police killed 26 rioters and arrested 3,000 following the violence, which left over a dozen security forces dead. But Kazakhstan also called for help from abroad after the president appealed to the Collective Security Treaty Organization. Russia and other members of the regional alliance sent troops to the country, a move the U.S. said it was closely monitoring. We have questions about the nature of this request and whether it has it was a legitimate invitation or not. Uh, we don't know at this point. Uh, the world will, of course, be watching for any violation of human rights and actions that may lay the predicate for the seizure of Kazakh institutions. In the meantime, President Tokayev said the government would restore some price caps on liquefied gas, as surging costs are what sparked the demonstrations. But it may be too little too late. The protests have now grown to include wider discontent over authoritarianism and corruption, issues the government has thus far failed to address. Heavy rainfall in Brazil has caused mass chaos as around 823 people were impacted by the floods which followed, forcing more than 200 families out of their homes in the eastern Brazilian state of Maranhão. With water up to their hips, helpless victims ventured outside their flooded homes. With no means to leave and still shocked by how the water soared, victims raised their mattresses a few feet below the roof and hung their clothes from lines above their heads. Heavy rainfall flooded homes in the northeast region of Brazil, leaving many residents scrambling to spare food and other items from the water. Previously, floods in the state of Bahia, south of Maranhão, killed at least 20 people and displaced 19,000 from their homes. More than 11,000 people have been displaced in the Brazilian state of Bahia by flooding, with authorities scrambling to provide relief to residents without alternate housing. The state civil protection agency said the heavy rains have killed multiple people since November, including the latest death today. The intensifying protests in Sudan have turned even more lethal now as medics said Sudanese security forces shot dead three protesters during the latest mass demonstrations demanding a transition to civilian rule after a coup. Braving the tear gas, Khartoum residents continued their months-long protests against the military regime. All across Sudan, thousands of people took to the streets on Thursday to demand a transition to civilian rule. More than two months in, Sudan's protest movement was still going strong, despite a brutal repression that's left dozens of people dead and hundreds injured. Undeterred by the deadly use of force, protesters have continued to denounce a military takeover led by General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan. The October 25th coup had derailed the country's democratic transition following the ousting of longtime dictator Omar al-Bashir in 2019. 
On Sunday, Sudanese Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok announced his resignation, saying he had failed to stop the country's slide into chaos. Formerly acclaimed by the people, he was accused of betrayal after signing a power-sharing deal with the army in November. The military now says it wants to replace Hamdok as soon as possible, but the international community has warned that nominating a new prime minister without holding elections could further undermine what little is left of the regime's credibility. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now on to the updates of the COVID pandemic. The World Health Organization has assured that Beijing's plans to ensure next month's 2022 Winter Olympics will go ahead safely despite the COVID-19 pandemic are optimistic in it being the mostly COVID-controlled event. WHO officials are optimistic the Beijing Games will take place safely despite the rise of the Omicron variant. They expressed confidence in the measures put in place by Chinese authorities. We don't perceive that there's any uh, particular extra risk in, in, in hosting or, or running the Games. But, but obviously we will keep uh, all of the measures that are being put in place under constant review. China has a zero tolerance COVID policy in place, but has faced multiple outbreaks in recent weeks. Beijing sealed its Winter Olympic bubble on Tuesday preparing venues, transport and staff for the world's strictest mass sporting event. Should an athlete unfortunately test positive, he or she would have to return two negative PCR tests separated by 24 hours. Then he or she would move to a regime where the test will be made twice a day. Olympic officials have urged athletes to take precautions from now as global COVID cases reach unprecedented levels. The Games get underway on the 4th of February. With the Omicron variant driving up COVID-19 cases globally, the World Health Organization is warning a tsunami of cases is overwhelming global health systems. Due to the strain, many parts of the world, including Europe, the United States, are setting new milestones for fresh infections. The WHO chief says the Omicron variant should not be dismissed as a mild form of COVID-19. While Omicron does appear to be less severe compared to Delta, especially in those vaccinated, it does not mean it should be categorized as mild. Just like previous variants, Omicron is hospitalizing people and it's killing people. In fact, the tsunami of cases is so huge and quick that it is overwhelming health systems around the world. Speaking at a press briefing in Geneva on Thursday, he said record numbers of people are catching the virus, causing hospitals to become overwhelmed in many parts of the world. Just under 9.5 million new COVID-19 cases were reported to the WHO last week, a 71 percent on-week increase. However, the WHO chief said even this is an underestimate. In addition, according to Our World in Data, a global statistical site, over 2.6 million new cases were reported worldwide on January 4th. This comes as Europe, as well as North, Central and South Americas, are seeing a drastic surge in Omicron cases. Data, however, show the number of deaths is declining. Due to Omicron, the EU reported over 1 million new cases on Wednesday, a record single-day rise. The number has increased rapidly since the last week of December. The U.S. is also grappling with Omicron, with over 4 million new cases reported throughout the past seven-day period, ending Wednesday. According to data released by Johns Hopkins University, this is a whopping 89 percent jump from the previous week. Israel is also witnessing a record number of new infections, with over 16,000 new cases reported on Wednesday. This is a record high for the country since the onset of the pandemic. Its health authorities warned that Israel needs to brace for the worst as it could lock nearly 50,000 new daily infections in a week from now. Immunocompromised citizens in Chile are set to be lining up for yet another jab as the country will soon begin offering a fourth shot of the coronavirus vaccine in an attempt to fend off the surging infection rates. 
Chile is set to become the first country in Latin America and one of the first in the world to offer a fourth shot of the COVID-19 vaccine as the highly transmissible Omicron variant is spreading worldwide. Chilean President Sebastián Piñera on Thursday said the extra dose will first be offered to immunocompromised citizens. Experience has shown us that the vaccines and boosters' efficacy diminishes over time and with the appearance of new variants. For these reasons, we want to announce today that starting next Monday, January 10, we are going to start a new mass vaccination process with a fourth dose or a second booster dose. Come February, more Chileans will be able to receive the fourth shot. Starting Monday, February 7, we'll extend this vaccination to citizens of age 55 and over who have completed six months since their last dose, to medical workers and to people who may be at risk. Chile has one of the world's highest vaccination rates, having administered two doses to over 85 percent of the population. And data shows about 57 percent have received a booster shot. News of a fourth dose in Chile comes as several countries report all-time high COVID-19 caseloads, even among vaccinated populations. President Emmanuel Macron of France is now also officially the president of the EU for the next six months. In order to mark this occasion, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen paid a visit to the country where the two leaders paid respect to influential figures in the country's history. Let's cross over to other there in a world news special correspondent Prashani Rodrigo, who's joining us now from Helsinki in Finland. Prashani? Yes, Shanani. France's President Emmanuel Macron welcomed European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen at the Elysee Palace in Paris ahead of a working dinner with the European Commissioners to mark the beginning of a six-month French spell as Presidency of the Council of the European Union. France took over the rotating presidency this year. France last held the presidency 13 years ago under President Nicolas Sarkozy. Macron has said France would use the occasion to push the Union to move on topics ranging from post-COVID economic recovery to migration policy and European defence. The French president also paid tribute to a pair of leading European figures as France formally took the reins of the 27-nation bloc for the next six months with big ambitions. Macron was accompanied by the head of EU's executive arm, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, at the France's famed Pantheon to honour the memories of Simon Weil and Jean Monnet. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adha Terena World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. North Korea made it official that it will not participate in this year's Beijing Winter Olympics. It was reported that the decision was conveyed to China in a letter in which it cited concerns over COVID-19 and what it calls conspiracy of hostile forces, referring to diplomatic boycott of the US and its allies. Cities in central China's Henan province carried out COVID-19 testing and prepared food to deliver to people in lockdown, while authorities in the northwestern city of Jiang apologized to a woman whose miscarriage during lockdown stirred public outrage. Cambodian Prime Minister was met by honor guard and a red carpet in Myanmar just as protests by coup opponents broke out in other parts of the country over fears his trip will provide more legitimacy to the junta. The price of Bitcoin is down more than 3.5% in the past day or so, in a part because of anxiety about Federal Reserve, but also a nationwide internet blackout in Kazakhstan, which is the world's second biggest country for Bitcoin mining after the US. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday on more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. While most heritage sites are fiscal, Colombia chose to stand out from the rest as the country celebrated the Black and White Carnival, considered to be the intangible heritage by UNESCO. We are leaving you tonight with the splashes of colour and spirit that was abundant during the carnival. Thank you for joining us and have a great night.